I want to get to this last story. Then I have to get out of here because I have to get ready to teach a class uh, today and tomorrow. So I have a lot of work to do. I saw this story dealing with Marla Gibbs. Um, who played uh, Florence Johnston on The Jeffersons, okay? And she was Mary Jenkins on 227. I saw this article from AtlantaBlackStar.com and I posted it on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, when uh, this article came in. And this article came out November 3rd, so... It was um, before the midterm elections when I posted it. It got thousands of likes on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. I also posted it in the uh, World Facebook group that I'm in. I posted it there as well, okay, because I'm a big fan. Everybody, People that know me, they know I'm a big fan of the T-Show, A Different World. That, I mean, that show, that show is such a powerful show. And it, it came on when I was in high school and then in college. So, I mean, that show changed a lot of our lives and inspired many of us to want to go to college or do better in college. Um, you know, that, that show was just transformational. But Marla Gibbs, um, who played the maid Florence Johnston, the Jefferson's maid for 10 seasons, on um, the CBS show, The Jeffersons. She was interviewed by Sherry Shepard, okay, on Sherry Shepard's new talk show, day daytime talk show. And Marla Gibbs revealed that the producers of the show 227, which aired on NBC, wanted her to be a single mother raising a daughter. They did not want her to be married. And Marla Gibbs said that she, she, she said she told them, I will not do the show man. I will not do the show without a man. And she explained how she had to fight to portray a married African-American family. And she fought to have an African-American husband on that show and i like the show 227 i watched the, the you know reruns on on hulu it was a, it was a really good show i think it was better before jack a harry left she also talks about how she fought to have jack a harry on the show play sandra as well okay so this is a this is a fascinating story here um the legendary marla gibbs who i, I think is underrated she's nine years old she just got the hollywood her star on the hollywood walk of fame i think marla gibbs is is really is still underrated okay but the legendary marla gibbs appeared on the uh sherry shepherd uh show where she prayed where uh she received praise for her beauty and groundbreaking career in entertainment now, the actress, best known for playing housekeeper Florence Johnston, now they misspelled her, her name, her character's name, is not Florence Johnson, it's Johnston with a T. Okay, but we forgive AtlantaBlackStar.com, they do some good reporting. The actress best known for playing housekeeper Florence Johnston on the beloved sitcom The Jeffersons also played Mary Jenkins on 227. She was recently cast in season 19 of Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy is still on the air. And the Snoop Dogg produced film Bromates. The Snoop Dogg produced film Bromates. Now, Sherry Shepard was present when Marla Gibbs received her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in July 2021. And uh, Marla Gibbs said, oh, it was so fabulous. Uh, Gibbs said of her, a big day. I never expected it. That was all Regina's idea, referring to Regina King, okay, who played her daughter, Brenda Jenkins, 
on the show um two two seven here's a picture of marla gibbs here 91 years old now marla gibbs was also on the episode of at least one episode of the tv show a different world she played the principal at the school that whitley was a substitute teacher at if you remember in season six um she played the principal of, of the inner city school okay they also had an episode in season six with billy d williams on as well okay and we know that billy d williams had a had a cameo on the jeffersons and florence johnston was billy d williams biggest fan right Okay, so Sherry Shepard clarified that fellow star Regina King was responsible for getting everyone on board with getting Marla Gibbs a Hollywood star. She said, quote, they turned us down the first year, said Marla Gibbs, who feels much younger than she is. She said, I think somebody got that wrong. I'm 30, I'm um, 30 years old, said the woman who jokingly turns uh, that age every year. She turns 30 every year. It sounds like Jack Benny turned 39 every year. Um, so Sherry Shepard reminded the audience that Mark, uh, that Marla Gibbs, uh, brought the idea of the show 227 to Jefferson's creator, Norman Lear. It was Marla Gibbs who brought the idea of the show 227 to Jefferson's creator, Norman Lear. And Norman Lear was, uh, the developer of the TV show Good Times, which is created by Eric Monte and Mike Evans or Michael Evans. And Michael Evans was the first Lionel on the Jeffersons. And Eric Monte and Michael Evans were writing partners. And, and when you watch the Good Times at the, at, the, uh, at the end of Good Times, when they show the credits, the credits, every episode it says created by Eric Monte and Mike Evans. And the character of Michael Evans, the youngest son, is named after Mike Evans, co-creator of Good Times, who was the first Lionel on the Jeffersons. Now, Marla Gibbs then revealed that the show 227 was initially a play that ran for six months. And she starred in the play as Mary Jenkins. It was seen by Brandon Tartikoff, who was the president of NBC from 1981 to 1991. I remember when Brandon Tartikoff was the president of NBC. And when the Cosby show came out in 1984, NBC moved from last place to first place. They had the Cosby show, then they, 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 they and they had family ties, they had cheers, they had Golden Girls, 227, Miami Vice, but the Cosby show. That show was so phenomenal. It took NBC from last place to first place. Out of, you just had three networks then, okay? NBC, ABC, CBS. Marla Gibbs said, so when Norman Lear finally came to see it, which I had invited him, but then he heard about it, he said, I hear you have a good play. I said, yeah. He said, well, I want to see it. I said, well, you better come tomorrow because we're closing. Okay. Now, I don't know if she ended the sentence by saying child. Okay. Because <laughs> we're closing child. Because on, on the TV show 227, oh my God. They, they, I, I, I haven't heard so many honeys and childs since, you know, probably. Maybe when I was in Mississippi when I was six years old or something like that. I don't know. What. <laughs> that's, that show has like a, a like a down home Southern feel to it, to it with uh, Helen Martin playing Cheryl, uh, uh, Pearl Shea, the veteran actress Helen Martin, who was weeping Wanda on uh, Good Times. And you have Elena Reed Hall who was uh, Susan on, yeah, Susan on Sesame Street, who was Gordon's younger sister, Susan on Sesame Street, Elena Reed Hall. Reed Hall. Um, now, due to their first and legendary series, Norman Lear offered, the, the Jeffersons, 
Norman Lear offered to also produce 227 with Marla Gibbs. So Marla Gibbs said, so I said, okay, that's home. I'm already doing the Jeffersons, but check this out. Now, this is, this is the same thing that Norman Lear and the white people who controlled good times did to, 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 to Esther Rowe. We're gonna, I'm going to give you some background history on this. Marla Gibbs said, but then when I got it, the, the script and all that stuff, what they put together, Norman Lear had two other producers who were also African-Americans, but they did not agree with anything I wanted to do. Now, she's the one who came up with the idea of 227 based upon the play that she was starring in. OK, the 227 play. She's the one that comes up with the ideal of the TV show. She said, Marla Gibbs said, when they wanted her character, Mary Jenkins, they wanted her character, Mary Jenkins, to portray a single woman to which Marla Gibbs replied, I will not do the show without a man. I will not do the show without a man. Now, in the play, 227, she had a husband in the play. For those who watched 227, Marla Gibbs' character was married to, to, to Lester Jenkins, portrayed by Hal Williams, African-American actor Hal Williams, who also played Lester Jenkins in the play. So you go from a play to a TV show, she has a black husband in the play, but Norman Lear, you want her to be a single mother raising a black child. You want to cut the black man out like you did John Amos when you fired John Amos at the end of season three of Good Times because you didn't like the portrayal of a strong black father. You wanted a buck dancing Negro like JJ. You didn't like the portrayal of a strong black father, Norman Lear. Their chemistry was already established between um, Marla Gibbs and Hal Williams, which made it easier to add lines and transform them into a series. The chemistry they had in the play made it easier to transform this into a TV series. Marla Gibbs had to fight for Hal Williams the same way she fought for actress Jack A. Harry who played Sandra Clark on the TV show 227. Now, Marla, Marla Gibbs used what power she had. And it may have been a little bit of power because she wasn't, we knew her from the Jeffersons, but she didn't star in the Jeffersons, right? She was the co-star. Sherman Hemsley, Isabel Sanford, they started Jeffersons. The Jeffersons is a spinoff from All in the Family, okay? The Jeffersons is a spinoff from All in the Family. So Marla Gibbs used what power she did have in Hollywood to fight for these roles for African-American actors and actresses. She fought for Hal Williams because she wanted to portray. She So, and remember on uh, the Jeffersons, she was a single woman on the Jeffersons. She would date here and there, but she really didn't have a love life on the Jeffersons and she wanted to portray a married black family. So she had to fight for this. So uh, there was a tweet in the article here from Jamie A. Thompson, PhD. Next to Abbott Elementary, I love 80s episodes of 227 with Marla Gibbs, Jackie Harry, Hal Williams, and the young Regina King. It's bringing so much realness OK, uh, what did you use to put on, on that perfume, a spray gun? <laughs> the interactions between they were friends in real life, Marla Gibbs and Jack A. Hare. OK, but the interactions between them on the show was classic. OK, it's similar to it's similar to Red Fox and uh, LaWanda Page, uh, Aunt Esther, who were actually friends in real life. It's similar to that. OK. So Marla Gibbs said, I fought for him, referring to Hal Williams. 
I I got him and then Jack Hay came in and she did an audition actually first for uh, 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 Rose Holloway, who was uh, Mary Jenkins' best friend, who was played by Elena Reed Hall, who was the who played Susan on Sesame Street. OK, Gordon's younger sister, Susan. But then she asked Jack A. Harry asked if she could play Sandra, Sandra. Sandra and we said yes. She did, and she was hysterical. She Jack A. Harry played that role, and Jack A. Harry blew up from that uh from that character of Sandra Clark. So much so I remember when uh Jack A. Harry uh was a guest host of the Tonight Show. Uh, Johnny Carson to the Tonight Show before when, when Johnny Carson was still hosting the, the Tonight Show. Okay, she was a uh, uh, a guest host. It was one of the times when um, he wasn't on the show, and she blew up from that role of Jackie Harry. She also won an Emmy Award for that role as well. Okay, and then she's going to end up leaving the show two two seven to do movies, things like that didn't work out too well for her. She should have stayed on that show. Because if you notice, as they go into like the uh, uh, the third season, things like this, um, when you watch the opening credits, it'll say special guest Jackie Harry, because she only appeared a few times, I think maybe the third season, she only appeared a few times, and then she was largely just like written out of the script. They tried to give her a spinoff show. The spinoff show didn't work. One of the reasons why the spinoff show didn't work is because what they did see, this is Hollywood once again, okay? The TV show 227 had character and it focused on a working class African-American neighborhood where you had a black father, you had a married mother. Now, Rose Holloway, her, if I remember correctly, Rose had a, a daughter. If I remember correctly, her husband had passed away. But you still have a reference to marriage. Um, Pearl Shea, played by Helen Martin. Pearl Shea had been married three times. OK, and she's raising her grandson, Calvin. OK, Calvin Dobbs. But you still have a reference to marriage and you have this you have this community. When Jack A. Harry gets her, they did they did a pilot episode for the spinoff, which they show as one of the episodes of 227. She goes to New York and the guy she's supposed to work for, it ends up that that job falls through. She's desperate for money. She goes and um, gets a job working at a health spa, a health spa. She's the only African-American character except for one African-American guy who's um, who works at the health spot. All the other people are white. And the she did, didn't end up she ended up not getting the show. They did a pilot. I don't think it tested well. But look at what they did. They they built a loyal African-American audience because we saw us and we saw this this community, this black family and this black community. Then one of the stars of the show, you give them a spinoff and you drop her into a sea of white people. And you totally change the dynamics that drew us to watch 227 in the first place. When you do that, you also lock out a lot of African-American actors from opportunities because you give those opportunities to white actors and actresses. So this is the game that they played. All right, now, uh, in 1987, Jack K. Harry became the first African-American woman to win an Emmy Award for Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Comedy Series for 227. Jack K. was fantastic in this role, all right? But Marla Gibbs said NBC did not want her to have that role. NBC wanted Cheryl Lee Ralph 
to play Jack A. Harry. And Marla Gibbs had to fight for Jack A. Harry to get that role. She said, Marla Gibbs said, quote, they wanted somebody else, but I said, I want her. Like Uncle Sam says, I want you. She said, I want her because she's going to work. Marla Gibbs said, Jack A. is going to work. The other person I loved, but nobody would believe she lived in this building. Okay. She was just sophisticated, Marla Gibbs insists, but Jack A. was hysterical. Now, Jack A. Harry's historic Emmy win paved the way for Cheryl Lee Ralph, who's a fantastic actress also. When we first saw Cheryl Lee Ralph in the uh, Bill Cosby, Sidney Poitier movie, uh, A Piece of the Action, okay? And she was one of the high school delinquents, okay? Cheryl Lee Ralph, brilliant, brilliant actress. Jack K. Harry's win for Best Supporting Actress in the Comedy Series, for, uh, the Emmy win, paved the way for Cheryl Lee Ralph to win the same award in early 2020, early this year in 2022, in September, as previously reported, Cheryl Lee Ralph won for her role as Miss Barbara Howard on the hit comedy series Abbott Elementary. Jack, Jack K. Harry praised Cheryl Lee Ralph for being the second woman to do so and creating a full circle moment. Jack K. Harry, who also starred in the TV show Sister to Sister with Tia and uh, uh, Tamara, Maori, and she, she co-starred opposite Tim Reed, veteran actress Tim Reed, who we probably first saw on the TV show uh, WKRP in Cincinnati, okay? Uh, 1970s, 1980s TV show about the radio station WKRP in Cincinnati. And there's actually a WKRP in Cincinnati. It's Channel 5. It's a TV, it's a TV station. I don't know if they have a radio station, but they do have a TV station. Okay. So we first saw him as Venus Flytrap, the, the cool hip uh, uh, DJ. Okay. That, that made me want to work at a radio station too. Watching, seeing WKRP in Cincinnati, that made me want to work in a radio station. Okay. And I'm, I'm a DJ now. Uh, well, I'm not a DJ. I'm a radio show host, not a DJ. Okay. But uh, we saw him then. And then we saw him on the TV show, uh, Simon and Simon as Lieutenant uh, Downtown Brown. Okay. Um, and then he did Frank's Place as well. All right. But he's a, he's a brilliant, brilliant actor. Very versatile. So he goes from playing a cool guy like Venus Flytrap to playing somebody who's kind of nerdy and conservative, uh, Ray, I think his name was Ray, on uh, 227, one of the, uh, one of the parents of, of one of the twins. So winning my Emmy uh, was a career highlight, but it was also a lonely experience, said Jack A. Harry. Um, she tweeted this along with a photo of herself with the Emmy she won. She said, Jack A. Harry said, for 35 years, I've been the only black woman to win Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Comedy Series, but that all changes tonight. That all changes tonight, and it's a, a, full, a full circle. It comes full circle, hashtag Emmys. Now, in a second tweet, the 66-year-old uh, Jack A. Harry confirmed that NBC wanted Cheryl Lee Ralph to play Sandra Clark instead of her. She said, quote, the network originally wanted uh, at the Cheryl Lee Ralph, uh, her Twitter handle, at the Cheryl Lee Ralph to play Sandra on 227. But I got the part. But I got the part and won uh, the Emmy. I got the part and won an Emmy for it. Now, Cheryl Lee Ralph joins me as the second black woman in this category, and deservedly so. I'm so excited for her hashtag Emmys win. Okay, so that's a great, great story. But you have African American actresses supporting one another, lifting one another up, fighting for fighting for roles for other people, using. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the fact that uh, Marla Gibbs 
was able to use what power she had in Hollywood to fight to have a black man be her husband. That's fantastic. Now that's similar to what happened with uh, on Good Times, okay? With Esther Rowe. Now the TV show Good Times was a spinoff of All in the Family, all right? Um, and sorry, TV show Good Times was a spinoff of Maud. TV show Good Times was a spinoff of Maud. Maud was a spinoff of All in the Family. Um, Maud was Edith Bunker's cousin, okay? And Maud was played by B. Arthur. And I, I like watching a lot of those old shows today because you get to see what was going on uh, back then politically and in the culture. And one thing that I think is really important to note, and I'm, I'm all for women equal rights. Don't, I don't want you to misunderstand that, right? I'm all for women having equal rights, especially African-American women. But um, on the show, Maud, Maud is a feminist, and she's on her fourth husband. The husband that you see her married to, that's her fourth husband, okay? Her daughter is either separated or divorced, one of them. Her daughter is separated or divorced and moves back home with her young uh, male, you know, her young son that she's raising. So now this is at a time, like early 1970s, this is at a time when you had the women's liberation movement. I'm all for women having equal rights, equal pay, equal rights, all that stuff. I'm all for that. But it's just interesting that Maude is a feminist and she's on her fourth husband. And her daughter is either divorced or going through a divorce uh, and raising, you know, raising her son on her own, basically on her own also. So Florida Evans was um, odd made, okay? Florida Evans was Maud's maid, and she was married to a man named Henry Evans. Originally, it was played by a different actor, and then they brought in John Amos to play Henry Evans. So, on the TV show Maud, um, John Amos or Henry Evans. He was a firefighter. He was a fireman, right? The last episode that Esther Roll appears as Florida Evans, they write into the storyline that uh, John Amos' character, who came, who was, who was uh, on the TV show uh, Mary Tyler Moore, he was playing Woody, the sportscaster on Mary Tyler Moore. Okay. This is where we see him before. This is before Kunta Kente. This is before Roots in 1977. Uh, Henry Evans gets a raise at work. He's a firefighter. He gets a raise at work. He's making more money. And he wants his wife to stop being a maid. So this is like the last episode where Florida Evans appears. Then, so she gets her spinoff show, Good Time which is about her raising her family in the, uh, in the projects like the Gabrini green projects, but the producers of the show and the developers of the sh developers of the show, like Norman Lear, they wanted her to be a single mother raising three children. But wait a second. She had a husband when she was a maid on mold, a black man. She had a husband when she was a maid on mold. You end her tenure on Maud with her husband getting a raise at work. So they're moving up economically, and he wants her to quit her job working for a white woman. 
But now that you give her her own show, you want to cut the black man out, Norman Lear. So Esther Rowe had to fight for Florida Evans to be married. Now, she was married when she was a maid working for the white woman. But now she gets her own show and you want her to be a single mother, Norman Lear. So she fights and they capitulate. And let John Amos continue the role that he played on Maul. But they changed his name to James Evans. And then when they bring in his father, his father's name is Henry Evans. But they had to have his father abandon his family and they get reunited. This whole screwed up stuff coming through the lens of white supremacy. Now, Eric, it's important to know Eric Monty and Mike Evans, they were writing scripts and they were writing roles that defy stereotypes. This is this is why Eric Monty, who's the co-creator of Good Times, this is why he came to Hollywood. Okay. And he also Eric Monty also wrote the screenplay for Cooley High. And the and the TV show What's Happening is loosely based on Cooley High because in Cooley High, Preach played by um um Glenn Turman or Glenn Thurman who goes on to play uh, Colonel Bradford Taylor on A Different World. Glenn Turman's character of Preach wants to be a writer, okay? And he also wore the black glasses, black rim glasses. So Roger Thomas on what's happening, he wants to be a writer. He also wears the black rim glasses also, like Preach and Cooley High. So they give Florida Evans a husband on good times, but they give him a sixth grade education. Now, I don't think you can be a sixth grade education. He was a fire was a fireman on mall who gets a raise at work and he's making more money. So he wants his wife to stop working for the white woman. But when they get the when they get their own show, when Florida Evans gets her own show, Esther Rowe, they want her to be a single mother. She puts her foot down and says, no, I want a black man as my husband. So they said, okay, we're going to give you a black man. We're, we're going to give him a sixth grade education. And he's going to have two minimum wage jobs. And he's, he, and he's barely going to be able to afford to pay the subsidized rent in the projects. They give Florida Evans a 10th grade education. And in, in, I think it was the third episode, eviction day, uh, he has to go get the pool stick out the, out the, they didn't even have a closet. They had a, a drape for what was supposed to be a closet. And he has to go hustle to, to get the rent money so they don't get evic evicted, the, the subsidized rent money. And JJ becomes... Uh, Jimmy Walker, comedian Jimmy Walker, becomes the breakout star of the show. But he's portraying a stereotypical character who's ignorant, barely literate. He is a fantastic artist. But this is something that they slip in on the cast. And Eric Monty and, and uh, Mike Evans... Because Mike Evans was the original line on the Jefferson. So when the when Good Time starts, Mike Evans leaves Good Time. He leaves the Jeffersons portraying, portraying Lionel Jefferson. He goes to work on the set of Good Times uh, full time as a writer and co-creator of Good Times. So then on the Jeffersons, they bring in another actor named Damon Evans, no relation, to be the second Lionel. Then when Good Times ends, about 1979, Michael Evans goes back to the Jeffersons and reprises his role as Lionel Jefferson. I also didn't like how uh, Norman Lear and the other ones, uh, the, the producers of Jeffersons, had to have Lionel and Jenny get a divorce. Why you can't have young people or younger people in their 20s? You can't have younger black people married, they have to get a divorce. Why, Norman Lear? 
I remember Cheryl Lee Ralph left the TV show Moesha because she played Brandy's mother, her stepmother Moesha on the TV show Moesha. And she leaves after the, the powers that be of the show wrote into the script that the black father in the show cheated on his wife. And Shirley Ralph didn't like that. She said this was a this was a good show. You had a good black family. You had a black father. Why would you have to write infidelity into the script and ruin the show? If you you know, I, I, I've done a lecture series uh, called the media's deliberate destruction of the African-American family. And. We deal with like the history of media and TV shows, things like this. And I interviewed Bernadette Stannis twice on the African History Network show who plays Thelma Evans. So I did a lot of research preparing for my interview with her also. And this is one of the books that that, that was uh, one of my part of my research for my lecture series and my interview as well with Bernadette Stannis. Uh, Blacks in American Films and Television by uh, an illustrated encyclopedia by Donald Vogel. Okay, Blacks in American Films and Television. Okay, an illustrated encyclopedia by Donald Vogel. So all the movies and TV shows that had like a significant African-American character up until maybe about 1987, 88, because this book came out in 1988, they have an entry, they have an encyclopedic entry uh, of it here and they have one for good time so it's broken up between tv and uh movies okay so they have one here for good times it's in alphabetical order uh so they have one here for the jeffersons january 18th 1975 to june 23rd 1985 so they have one here for the jeffersons the the crazy thing about the jeffersons is that when the show was canceled, um, they didn't tell the cast, really. Uh, I remember, if I remember correctly, Mips says she learned that the show was canceled after 10 seasons by reading about it in the newspaper. And even the uh, unsung Hollywood edition of TV One that they did on the Jeffersons, they talk about that there as well. The Jeffersons was on for 10 years, CBS. The, the producers, they did not give them a finale show. They did not give them a wrap up show. Basically, they did not tell the uh, cast that the show was canceled. They read about it in the newspaper. Just total disrespect. Just total disrespect. Landmark TV show like that. But they have an entry here for good times. I'm just going to share uh, an excerpt with you because uh, we have to get out of here. How's everybody doing? Also, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. And we have the information on the homepage of our website. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills, pay uh, cover expenses when I got to travel out of town, et cetera, like I had to do to Washington, D.C., uh, if you look at this entry here for good times, this is page 275 and 276 of uh, Blacks in American Films and Television. So they have the entry here for good times. Okay. Also, give me a break is on there also. Mel Carter, give me a break. Unfortunately, a stereotypical role taking care of a white family. So Good Times aired February 8th, 1974 to August 1st, 1979. Aired on CBS, created by Eric Monty and Michael Evans, developed by Norman Lear. Look at this right here, developed by Norman Lear. Okay, I don't know if you can see this. This book is coming apart. 
developed by Norman Lear. Okay. I want you to see all this here. All right. CBS created by Eric Monty and Michael Evans developed by Norman Lear. So Norman Lear is the one that fired the black father, John Amos. Because Norman Lear said that a black father on a sitcom is not funny. Now, we like John Amos. So Norman Lear, what gives you the authority to determine for black people what is funny? I just find that very interesting. Let me pull, let me go back to the picture here. I just find that very interesting. And this is uh, something that Eric Monty said. Eric Monty, so I did a lot of research when I was uh, preparing for my interview with uh, Bernadette Stannis and also for um, my lecture series, The Media's Deliberate Destruction of the African American Family. I did a lot of research on different shows, on Good Times, researched Eric Monty. Eric Monty said that Norman Lear kept telling him, you have to get rid of that black father. You have to get rid of that black father. He said a black father on a sitcom is not funny. Okay. Now, Archie Bunker on All in the Family was funny. He's white. Why can't you have a black father that's funny also? He doesn't have to be a clown. You know, John Amos was funny, but he wasn't a clown. You don't have to be a clown to be funny. Here's an excerpt of what the uh, entry says by Donald Bogle. This half-hour weekly series about the problems and joys of the Evans family was the 1970s first uh, family sitcom and has been considered uh, something of a groundbreaker and has been considered something of a groundbreaker, which it was. This was the first depiction really of an African-American family we saw each week. OK, uh, clearly it can be credited with having introduced to a national TV to, to national TV, a new point of view of African-American life. The series offered a portrait of an African-American family living in the slums, a tenement building on Chicago's south side that is referred to as cockroach towers, quote unquote. cockroach towers and confronted daily with a set of harsh urban realities. Good Times focused on Florida Evans, who played Esther Rowe, uh, who first appeared as the maid on Maud. Her husband, James, played by John Amos, and their three children, J.J. or Jr., portrayed by Jimmy Walker, comedian Jimmy Walker, Thelma, played by Bernadette Stannis, and Michael, played by Ralph Carter. As the father searched for a better job, unemployment was a recurring uh, theme. Discrimination and poverty were also dealt with. Discrimination and poverty were also dealt with. Disgruntled and angered by his economic plight, the father, James, announced in one episode, the president said he was going to bring us all together, but no one told us it would be in on a bread line. So he's, if I remember correctly, he's referring to President uh, Gerald Ford after Nixon resigned from office, after Nixon resigned in August of 1974. He's referring to President Gerald Ford. Okay, now, uh, weekly, the show's theme theme song spoke of temporary layoffs and easy credit ripoffs and keeping your head above the water, making the wave when you can. Temporary layoffs, okay? Also, it says hanging in a chow line, C-H-O-W, not hanging in a jiving. It's hanging in a chow line, like a food line, a bread line. 
Good Times managed to touch on some of the language, the rhythms and attitudes of ghetto experience seen at one point in some 18 million homes. The series seemed to elicit viewer identification from African-Americans and whites alike who saw the struggle for economic and social survival of the Evans family as being part of their own. Always stressed, however, was the theme of America as a land of opportunity. There was also a lot of love in the, in the home. They, James and Florida Evans, they had a lot of love for their children. So there's a lot of love in the family, but they also stressed education. They stressed education for their children. They, they stressed that they wanted a life better for their children. And they were willing to sacrifice to have a life better for their children as well. So we saw an emphasis on going to college. We saw an emphasis on, you know, going into careers. Um, uh, Thelma uh, to be a doctor. Uh, she she um, dabbles with writing a script for a play as well. Uh, we see Michael go to college. Michael wants to be an attorney. He wants to be a Supreme Court justice like Thurg Thurgood Marshall. So we see these themes in the show, which really helps to pave the way for a Cosby show in 1984, because with the Cosby show, you see the actualization of some of the dreams that Florida and John Amos had for their children in the projects. So we see Claire Huxtable, who's an attorney, who college graduate from Hillman College, he's an attorney. We see Heathcliff, Heathcliff Huxtable, who is a doctor graduates from Hillman College, fictitious college, Hillman College as well. They're married. So the dreams that we see Florida and James have for their children, Michael being an attorney, Thelma being a doctor, we see the actualization of that with the Cosby show. And then they have their own children and they want something better for their children than what they have. But their children grow up in the middle class neighborhood, so their children don't have the same drive that the civil rights uh, that the civil rights generation had. Their children don't have the same drive and determination. You know, eventually Theo gets his act together, things like this. Uh, eventually, Lisa Bonet, her character, go uh, uh, her, her, Denise, she goes back to college, Mega Everest College. Okay, but they don't have the same drive and determination that their parents had, that civil rights generation. Okay, so um, seen at one point in some 18 million homes, the series seemed to elicit viewer identification from blacks and whites alike who saw the struggle for economic and social survival of the Evans families being part of their own. Also, the TV show The Jeffersons paves the way for the Cosby show because we see an upwardly mobile married couple with the Jeffersons move into a deluxe apartment in the sky. And uh, incidentally, uh, the theme song for the Jeffersons was written by Janae Dubois, who played Walona Woods on Good Times, okay? Fish don't fry in the kitchen, beans don't burn, burn on the grill, a whole lot of trying just to get up that hill. Now we're up in the big leagues, getting that turn that bat, <laughs> okay? <laughs> as long as we're living as you and me, baby, ain't nothing wrong with that. See, that's Janae Dubois. Now, Janae Dubois and Esther Rowe were sorority sisters and Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated also. This is a little known African-American history fact. Now, always stressed, however, was the theme of America, a land of opportunity. Um, and in some cases, white viewers were permitted to patronize. In some, in, in some hold on just a second.
Okay. All right, we're back. Uh, we had a clip playing. Okay, now, viewed today, the series seems very much a period piece with its shortcomings more than apparent. Too much of its political stand, its determination to confront social problems and ills, strikes us as merely rhetorical. The most biting comments usually coming from the youngest and therefore least threatening son, uh, Michael. Okay, you all should be able to hear me now. The youngest and least threatening son, Michael, who they call the militant midget when he was younger, but as he grows older and goes to college and becomes more threatening, they stop calling him militant. Notice that he's called the militant midget when he's younger. OK. And he's smarter than JJ and, and, and Michael studies black history and he's in the black pride and things like this. OK. Uh, there's an episode where he talks about uh, black history week or Negro history week. There's an episode where he talks about uh, the Nation of Islam newspaper. Uh, Muhammad, I think I think he I think he, he refers to it as Muhammad speaks. OK. So you get all this coming from Michael. Not JJ. So Michael, who studiously keeps himself abreast of black history and achievements and who writes my favorite person school essays on Malcolm X and Jesse Jackson. Had the older Evans children been blessed with more serious attitudes or insights, the series might have really attained the socially committed, quote unquote, socially committed goals it wanted us to believe it saw. Instead, poor Thelma was used for the most part as a backdrop for jokes or for showcasing the problems of other family members. Worse was the fact that the oldest Evans child, JJ, seemed barely literate. Repeatedly, the audience was reminded that JJ was an artist and supposedly talented young black man trying to find a way, but Jimmy, but Jimmy J.J. Walker failed to communicate any type of artistic intense intensity or percept or, or uh, perceptivity, let alone something as fundamental as intelligence. What he became best known for was his trademark expression, Dino Might, and his coon antics. Um, uh, Donald Bogle's term, not mine, quote unquote, coon antics, which were throwbacks to Step and Fetch It and Willie Best, but without any of the former's nihilistic poise or the latter's slyly acute sense of timing. Perhaps the most telling comments on JJ were made by Esther Roll to Ebony Magazine. Now, this is Esther Roll who plays Florida Evans, who knows more about this basically than anybody else. And this is what she had to say about Jimmy J.J. Walker. I mean, sorry, about uh, Junior, James Evans Jr., J.J., okay? I don't think she's attacking Jimmy J.J. Walker. She talks about the change in his character and how the TV show started out being and what it ended up being. Esther Roll said, quote, I resent the imagery that says to black kids that you can make it by standing on the corner saying dynamite. He's 18, 18 years old, and he doesn't work. They do give him a job at the chicken shack, the ch chicken delivery place. And then at one point he's working as an usher at the theater. He's 18 years old and he doesn't work. He can't read or write. He doesn't think. The show did not start out to be that. The show did not start out to be that. Little by little, they have made J.J. more stupid and enlarged the role. So they gave him more airtime. Is this because this becomes a huge hit? OK, at one point, seen in 18 million homes. That's unthinkable today. Most TV shows today are not seen in 18 million homes. And then there was a, um, they had the good times trading cards 
like uh top like tops baseball cards they had the good times trading cards also jimmy jj walker had his own dial the jj dial and it was a uh that because i had one when i was a kid they had a, a stuffed dial and they had a, a jj walker dial had his hat everything and they had a cord that you pulled in his back and it said it 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 uh had uh recorded messages of jj walker okay and one of them was dino mike and i don't remember the other ones that they said but i remember dino mike because i had the i had the dial when i was a kid right so as the role goes on to say negative images have been quietly slipped in on us through the character of the oldest child and she talked about how that's not how the show was originally supposed to be that's not how the show started out but this is how it ends up okay and as jj as um, he becomes a fan favorite and people wait for him to say dynamite each episode. He becomes really popular. He gets more uh, screen time. OK, so read the rest of this here. Page 275 and 276. Of, um, this book here, Blacks in American uh, Films and Television, an illustrated encyclopedia by Donald Bogle. Okay, you got Red Fox right here. You have Eddie Murphy, Beverly Hills Cop, all of that. So fantastic. I don't even, that's out of print. I don't even take that out the house anymore. That thing's out of print. Okay. Um, be sure to register for the uh, online history classes that I teach on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And you're going to learn so much in these classes. You'll never look at history the same way. Uh, on Tuesdays is ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma uh, uh, on Tuesdays is uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And on um, Wednesdays, it is understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We also talk some about the film Black Panther. So I so some of the, the some of the slides I showed you uh, when we talked about uh, Black Panther Wakanda Forever, some of those slides are from uh, the presentation that we do, uh, or some of the slides that we use in the class. We go through and look at thousands of years of history and what leads up to uh, the transatlantic slave trade taking place. and let me see here we got a brief overview here for the sake of time you can also use this information with your children as well so the class is thoroughly documented i'm the one to put together the curriculum okay hold on where do we go Okay, let me bring up the, uh, okay, so here's the introduction to our Wednesday class, um, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We do the sessions live, but all the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime, okay? So a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire class. So we can't start uh, studying our history in slavery, even when we studied the transatlantic slave trade, okay? Even when we studied the transatlantic slave trade, we have to uh, deal with thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So we can't start studying our history uh, in slavery, even when we study the transatlantic slave trade, which is important to study. It is important to study. We can't start in 1619 or in the 1440s when the Portuguese get involved, 1441 with Anton Gonzalez going into Mauritania. We have to understand the history chronologically and deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who entered the Iberian Peninsula, today known as Spain and Portugal, um, in the Iberian Peninsula uh, from North Africa 
in 711 AD, okay, led by Tariq Ibn Ziyad. They go on in 10 and 710 AD, led by the General Tarif for the reconnaissance mission. And then they uh, go into uh, invade in 711 AD, led by uh, General Tariq Ibn Ziyad. This course not only deals with the transatlantic slave trade, but thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. August 20th, uh, 2019 uh, marked the 400th year anniversary of those 20 and odd Africans who came into Point Comfort in uh, Virginia, August 20th, 1619 in Virginia, in uh, what would later be the colony of Virginia. OK, and it, it's, uh, it's really at Hampton, Virginia, not Jamestown. It's actually at Hampton, Virginia. OK. Um, so there's a there's a, a section that we deal with in the class that deals with how like most of what you thought or most of what you thought you knew about August 20, 1619 is wrong. This year was known, uh, now 2019 uh, was known as the year of return as many African-Americans uh, were reconnecting to Africa and traveling to Ghana and other West African countries. When we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the original people of North, Central and South America and have been in the land we call the United States of America at least 51,700 years. We were here even before Native Americans came into existence. This, this does not mean the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. It means we have to understand thousands of years of history that take place before the transatlantic slave trade happened. So we deal in the class, the 800 year occupation of Europe uh, by the Africans known as the Moors, shocking archeological discoveries that are causing um, the scientists and archeologists, et cetera, to rethink everything. We look at insurance companies uh, that took out insurance policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans on the plantations, Freemasonry, America and the founding fathers, origins of the term America and Africa. Um, there's so much uh, history we look at in this class. What was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to it? What role did Christopher Columbus play in laying the foundation for the transatlantic slave trade? When did Africans first come to the U.S. as, uh, as slaves as well? Um, we look at uh, Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus, the link to ancient Kemet, Egypt, and early Christianity. Freemasonry in America, the fake Willie Lynch letter, 1712. We look at work from my friend, Dr. David M. Hotep, that wrote, that wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. We look at who the Khoisan people uh, are as well. Um, uh, we look at the uh, people of the Adam and Ida Islands, uh, also the Jarara uh, or the Adam and East. And we go through and look at different archaeological discoveries like uh, the uh, on the Greek island of Crete in uh, 2010, they developed stone tools that date back at least 130,000 years ago. We look at the uh, lost city of Egypt called Tanis Heraklion uh, that was revealed in 2003. And this uh, city was swallowed into the sea about 800 years ago or, or so. And they found a 16 foot tall statue, 700 uh, anchors, um, uh, all of this at the um, at the um, um, bottom of the sea, okay? And it's believed that it was built around 8th century BC, Thomas Heraklion, the lost city of Egypt. We show you some of the things that were found at the bottom of the sea as well. We look at uh, archaeological discoveries like this one here that came out in June 2017 uh in uh morocco where they found skeletal remains of homo sapiens that date back between 300,000 and 350,000 years ago 100,000 years before the oldest human remains uh that they found that date back 195,000 years ago in ethiopia so they keep having to push the timelines back okay they keep having to back that thing up juveniles had a song back that thing up when these archaeological discoveries come out they keep having to back that thing up they keep having to push the timelines back so the deeper they dig the black of the planet gets the the more research they do the older we get okay we talked about the omex uh omec heads in mexico and also um we, we cite dr david m hotel and the first americans were africans documented evidence that makes the link between the mandinka um uh, of West Africa 
and uh, ancient and ancient Egyptian culture in uh, the Omec connection. OK, uh, we look at uh, civilizations before Columbus comes to the land we call the United States of America as well. All right. Um, an African presence in early America before Columbus and slavery. And this was an article that Renoko Rashidi uh, wrote for AtlantaBlackStar.com. Uh, we look at the lost city of Egypt, um, Dazzling Aten, that was just discovered in uh, 2021, Dazzling Aten, the lost city of Egypt. Uh, so we go through and look at all this history. We do with the Druids. Um, and uh, one of the books that we use in the class is Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder, as well as uh, now Valley Contributions to Civilization. We look at Egypt of the West, which is what the U.S. is known as. There's also a link between Memphis, Tennessee and Memphis in Egypt. But when we look at the, um, the, the Washington Monument, the Washington Monument is an ancient African symbol called a Tekken. OK, and the layout of Washington, D.C. is a copy of the layout of ancient Egypt. Uh, my friend uh, um, Tony Browder deals with this in his tours of uh, uh, Washington, D.C. called Egypt on the Potomac as well. As he doc and he documents this in his book, Egypt on the Potomac also. And that's one of the uh, books that we use in the class. Now, you don't have to buy any of these books in the class. I show uh, on the screen uh, excerpts of the book. We use the books as reference. You, you don't have to feel obligated to buy any of these books. Uh, there are about 1,200 Tekkenu all throughout ancient Kemet. We see uh, Tekkenu from Kemet have been taken to London, England, Paris, France, and New York City. There's a good article from facetofaceafrica.com called Cleopatra's Needle, how three ancient Egyptian obelisks ended up in New York City, London, and Paris, France. We deal with the mythology of Osar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. This is the first, uh, this is the first holy trinity, okay? And on page 17 of Egypt on the Potomac, uh, Tony Browder says there were approximately 1,200 Tekkenu built in uh, Kemet in ancient times, but only about a dozen are found in Egypt today. Many of the Tekkenu removed from Egypt are now in Istanbul, Turkey, London, England, Paris, France, Berlin, Germany, New York, New York, uh, Rome, Italy, Vatican City, and elsewhere throughout the world. The Tekkenu, Tekkenu for plural, are now called obelisks by their new owners and few know their origin or that they symbolize the resurrection of the African king or Nesubiti, Asar, in the mythology of Asar, Aset, and Heru. He talks about this on page 17 of Egypt on the Potomac. Okay. We deal with the African influence in Star Wars as well, which is based upon the Asarian drama. Um, when we look at Freemasonry, the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. OK, uh, the term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of ancient Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So Browder talks about this on pages 18 and 32 of Egypt on the Potomac. So the concept of going to, first of all, the liberal arts colleges, that concept comes from the Grand Lodges, the, the, the House of Life, the Per Ankhs in ancient Kemet, okay, uh, where, where the initiates would study for 42 years and they learned 360 degrees of knowledge. And uh, George G.M. James talks about um, the seven liberal arts in uh, Stolen Legacy, uh, the rhetoric and the logic and the arithmetic, things like this. OK, so the concept of going to a institution of higher learning and getting your uh, credentials in a, in, in a series of degrees that comes from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. OK. So this is just a sample of the type of information that we cover uh, in the classes. And it's, it's a, visual, a visual class. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, all of this. All right. So I put together the class, the curriculum, all of this. Did you know 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons and 13 of the 39 signers of the U.S. Constitution were Freemasons? Now, Masonic temples are considered houses of light, houses of light or temples of learning. 
the term Mason, child of light, is a direct reference to the uh, highest degree of the comedic education system. The 33 degrees of instruction within Freemasonry represent a fraction of the 360 degrees of instruction that comprised the ancient comedic uh, system of education. Freemasons have held uh, positions of influence and power throughout the world for over 200 years. Check out page 33 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. So then we deal with the uh, offset. We look at some of the different Netaru, offset, um, and, uh, you know, Heru, who was the first Kairest. Kairest means rising of the spirit from the word Kairest comes the word Christ, which means anointed or anointed one. Uh, Osset was uh, she of throne or her name means she of throne or she is throne. You often see it depicted with a throne on her head because who sits uh, on the throne in Kemet that comes through the woman side of the family and uh, her attributes. She's associated with love and fertility. We know from uh, Osset and Heru. You get the Black Madonna and Child, which was worshipped all throughout Europe, even before the Moors going in 711 AD. The Black Madonna and Child was worshipped all throughout Europe. And then as you have a rise in European powers coming out of the Dark Ages, going from like the 1300s into the 1400s. And as they start to explore and conquer people's lands and extract the mineral wealth and build up Europe, as you have a rise in European powers, you have a rise in European phenotype, the European, European phenotype. And you have historical and religious figures get reinterpreted as European that were traditionally African figures. So you get you go from the black Madonna child that's African. You go to the white Mary and Jesus. And then Michelangelo paints the Sistine Chapel. I think in the 17th century, he shows his uh, aunt and uncle as the he uses aunt and uncle as the image of uh, as the model of Adam and Eve depicts them as Europeans. He depicts God as being a European, etc. OK, so we go throughout history and look at all this. We look at uh, uh, St. Nicholas, who was African as well. And we look at what are patron saints uh, also. And then uh, we look at why Christmas is celebrated on December 25th and understand that history because nowhere in the biblical text. Now, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness just because you never heard it before or disagree with it or don't like it. Does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. Nowhere in the biblical text. Does it state that Yeshua or Jesus the Christ was born on December 25th? Because the letter J wasn't created until 1630 AD. So when you look at the letter, when you look at the word Jesus in the dictionary, and you look at the etymology of the word, it takes you back to the Hebrew, Yeshua with a Y. Because the letter J didn't exist. Okay, the English language didn't exist in uh BC time. Okay. So we, we look at why Christmas is celebrated on December 25th. We also deal with the film black panther and the african influence in the film black panther like the panther deity bast comes from bastet the netter bastet which was worshipped worshipped in ancient kemet ancient egypt and she was a goddess worshipped in the form of a lioness at first and then later a cat so it had a woman's body and and a, a cat's head a black cat bastet was the netter or goddess of warfare in Lower Kemet, worshiped as early as the Second Dynasty, 2890 BC, BCE, before the Common Era. So we go through and look at the film Black, uh, we uh, do with the film Black Panther and what Wakanda means, because Wakanda is a real word. Wakanda, we see that in the Omaha, Omaha Ponca and Sioux Indian languages. It means possesses secret powers. We also see it in the Osage language as well. In Wisconsin, there is a Wakanda water park in Wisconsin. OK, so Wakanda is a deep word. It's even though it's a fictitious country in Central East Africa, somewhere around Rwanda or Uganda. It's a, 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 a deep word as, as well. And it's a key Congo word. It's an African word key in, in the key Congo language, which is a Bantu language. And it's in reference to family. We deal with Hannibal Barca and the Punic Wars, the Battle of Kanai 216 B.C. Also, we talk about Carthage, the Carthaginians. Uh, descendants of the Phoenicians. We we, we deal with all a lot of that history. We deal with Publius Cornelius Scipio, uh, who takes the surname Africanus after the Battle of Ozama in 202 BC, because his family last name was not Africanus; it was Scipio. And Africa 
in reference to the Afri is not named after Publius Cuneus Scipio Africanus. He takes his surname Africanus after the Battle of Zama in 202 BC, where uh, he, he defeats Hannibal Barca and conquers um, uh, Carthage. Okay. So I hear a lot of people say, oh, Africa is named after Roman general. No, it's not. You have to do more. You have to do more research. Please, 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 people, please do more research. Okay. Uh, so we talk about different uh, African civilizations, Axum and Carthage and Great Zimbabwe, uh, things of this nature. We go through and look at that. Uh, we deal with the uh, more the African Moors going into the Iberian Peninsula and going into Al Andalus, which is the southern portion of Spain where they settle Al Andalus, which is which means loosely translated is in reference to walking in the spiritual path or walking in the spiritual light. OK, so we go through and look at that history and uh, what leads to the Moors uh, losing control. Also, in uh, January 2nd, 1492, they lose their last stronghold, uh, Granada, in um, in uh, uh, Spain. Uh, General Tariq Ibn Ziyad, 711 AD. So we go through and look at uh, all that history. Also, we look at St. Maurice, the patron saint of Germany. We discuss the. National flags of Corsica and Sardinia, why they have African Moors heads on the national flags of Corsica and Sardinia. Uh, we look at uh, Ghana, Songhai, and Mali, also the three great West African kingdoms. We deal with Christopher Columbus, and uh, it's you got to understand the transatlantic slave trade, you have to deal with Columbus and his four voyages. Columbus never comes to the land we call the United States of America. The closest he comes here is Cuba, which is 90 miles away. But you got to deal with Columbus. And um, Columbus conquering Jamaica and Haiti and Puerto Rico and, and Honduras and Panama and the island of Hispaniola, the western portion, of the, the western third of the island of Hispaniola is where you have Haiti. And the, uh, the French are going to take control of um the western third of the island Hispaniola in 1697 from the Spanish. And this is going to lead to, you know, the Haitian Revolution, uh, 1791 to uh, 1803. But then we go through and, and study the transatlantic slave trade. OK, and look at this chronologically. Look at things like dumb diverses, the doctrine of discovery, et cetera, 1452. OK, uh, look at what are papal bulls, because you got to understand all this all these things to you know, really understand the transatlantic slave trade and how it evolves. And then also when the British get involved in the transatlantic slave trade in 1562 with uh, Sir John Hawkins. OK, so th this is just a sample of what we cover in this 10 week online class. So I teach this class on Tuesdays, sorry, Wednesdays, uh, 7 p usually 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. You can register for it right now. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. Classes on sale, uh, $60, regularly $130. So even a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire class. And then on Tuesdays, I teach from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Okay. You can use this information with your children also. And it takes a lot of work to teach this class it takes a lot of preparation each class even though i've been teaching understanding the transatlantic slave trade since 2017 on and off since 2017. it takes a lot of work and time to do each class so we definitely appreciate your support and this helps support the african history network and what we do as well so we posted the link here and we have the link to the uh courses on our on the courses page of our website and the bundle pack is the best value that's on sale, $100, the bundle pack. All right. Okay. And then on Tuesdays, um, we teach uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. That's on uh, Tuesdays, usually 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. I don't take attendance. Uh, you can see me in class. I can't see you. But we do have a lot of text chat, so you can ask questions, et cetera. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Uh, you can support us also through uh, Cash App and uh, PayPal. And we have the information on the homepage of our website. Uh, those in the Detroit area, be sure to come to the uh, lecture I'm doing on Black Panther Wakanda Forever on Saturday, November 19th 
at the uh, Hannon Center near Wayne State University. Okay. We have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And with all